My name is Peter Sloan. I'm a pulmonologist from Baltimore, Maryland, and this is the second of three-part series of talks on acid-base interpretation. I assume you've already viewed my first talk in this series, which was on simple acid-base disorders, as this talk picks up where the last talk left off. If not, you'll definitely have some trouble following the current talk, so you may consider going back to reviewing the original part one before proceeding. In the first talk, we discussed simple acid-base disorders and their compensation. In this talk, we will learn how to recognize second primary or double disorders and how to expose hidden or complex disorders. All of this with no formulas once again. I mentioned in the first talk, but it's worth mentioning again, that I'll be showing you the acid-base problems without any labels. 7.40, 40, 80, 24, 98. I won't go over this in details, the normals here, but our convention is pH first, PCO2 next, PO2 third, calculated by carbonate fourth, saturation 98. We're not going to go over O2 exchange, but I'm using 80 PO2 and saturation of 98 as placeholders, just so this is in a normal format. So, starting the talk. How do we recognize double disorders? First of all, some of these disorders I'll call unidirectional. We'll recognize that both disorders push the pH in the same direction. Best way to show you this is with an example. Very low pH, 7.10, is an acidosis. From my first talk, we recognize a respiratory acidosis, an elevated PCO2. But when we look for compensation, we realize the bicarb is low, it's also a metabolic acidosis. Now we know a respiratory acidosis would never be compensated by a metabolic acidosis and vice versa, so we can be fairly confident that both of these disorders are primary. So this is a double disorder. This is a primary respiratory acidosis and a primary metabolic acidosis. Cancellation is another way we recognize. The rule of thumb is if the pH is very close to 7.40 and there are acid-base disorders, there are likely to be more than one, at least two. So for example, this blood gas has a nearly normal pH, too close to 7.4 for any standard compensation. So we see a high PCO2 is a respiratory acidosis, a high bicarb is a metabolic alkalosis, they're both primary since Either one is too high to be pure compensation for the other abnormality. So this is a double disorder, respiratory acidosis and metabolic alkalosis, both of them primary. Hidden acid-base disorders are the trickier ones. So we start with the idea that an elevated anion gap always implies the presence of an anion gap metabolic acidosis. So for example, this is a completely normal blood gas. In fact, it's the normal one I gave you at the beginning of this talk. But in this case, we learn the anion gap is 30. Knowing the anion gap is 30 shows that there must be an elevated anion gap metabolic acidosis. The only way that can happen, as we'll discuss, is there should be a metabolic alkalosis. We'll get into that concept in a few minutes. So let's do some uh, problems. I went over this in the first talk in detail, but I do recommend as you look at these problems that you pause between problems before I go over the results and think about the solution and even work out the solution on a piece of paper before you play my results. It's a much better active learning experience if you solve these on your own. First problem, now that you have unpaused, is a near normal pH, looks like a respiratory alkalosis and also looks like a metabolic acidosis. This is a double disorder, respiratory alkalosis and metabolic acidosis. We don't know what the anion gap is. Second problem, very high pH, respiratory alkalosis, and also metabolic alkalosis, since respiratory alkalosis and metabolic alkaloses don't cancel each other, they're both primary and this is a double disorder. Third problem, completely normal blood gas with an elevated anion gap. We just went over that. This must have a hidden anion gap metabolic acidosis and also a metabolic alkalosis keeping the bicarb higher than would be expected. 
So here are the answers for your records, just to have a good look at the answers. So let's talk about complex acid-base disorder. First of all, before we get into the details of understanding complex acid-base disorders, it would be very helpful to understand exactly what an anion gap measures. So let's start with some concepts. We all have to agree that a patient's serum is intrinsically neutral. That is, the cations must balance the anions. Therefore, if we were to include all cations and anions in the blood, all of these charges should sum to zero. So let me give you an equation. The co concentration of sodium plus potassium plus other positively charged uh, ions, let's call them C, D, and E, those would be all of the positives in your blood. There might be more, but at least six or seven. Subtract away the concentrations of all of the negative ones. Chloride and bicarb are the big ones, and there are clearly some other ones. For example, uh, albumin is a negatively charged particle. Clearly, the whole sum of this is zero because the positives minus the negatives should equal zero. So what is an anion gap? The definition of an anion gap is just look at the large contributors. Sodium is the large contributor to positive chloride and bicarb. Well, since we're leaving out other contributors, this will not add up to zero. Anything but zero it would be most unusual for that to add up to zero. Uh, just want to let you know some institutions include potassium in the definition of anion gap. It's the same definition, just include potassium in the equation. Um, that's fine. Um, in labs that include the potassium, the normal anion gap value is about four higher to account for the potassium being in the equation compared to labs that don't have it. So we now know that because of how anion gap is defined, it's not equal to zero. Um, and, and the main reason is we've excluded several positively charged particles. Let's give some examples, calcium, magnesium, and then myeloma. Myeloma paraprotein is positively charged. And we've, of course, excluded some negative particles. Uh, for example, albumin, as I mentioned, and phosphorus. So now let's discuss complex acid base, a little bit more about the anion gap. So another definition of the anion gap, a little bit more interesting for the purposes of this discussion, is the anion gap is really a measure of the difference between unmeasured anions minus unmeasured cations. And in most people, there is a positive anion gap. That is, the unmeasured anions exceed the unmeasured cations. This definition is useful to clinicians in understanding complex acid-base disorders, as you will see. For example, if a patient has an elevated anion gap, which is pretty common, a search should be made to identify the unmeasured anion that is balanced with the measured cation. For example, in lactic acidosis, what's really happening is lactate is elevated, and that's an anion, but it's balanced with sodium. The sodium that's balancing it is measured in the anion gap equation, but the lactate is not part of the definition of anion gap. The alternative is also true. If the patient happens to have a lower than normal anion gap, a search should be made to identify the excess unmeasured cations, for example, an elevated calcium, or excessively positively, excessive positively charged paraproteins as seen in myeloma, or alternatively, we can look to identify an unmeasured anion that is lower than expected. And we know hypoalbuminemia lowers the anion gap because albumin is an unmeasured anion, so a low albumin will lower the anion gap by this equation right here. So this is complicated, but the concept's really clear. Think about an anion gap in terms of unmeasured anions minus unmeasured cations, and whenever the anion gap is high, think about what the possibilities are, and whenever it's low, there's really two possibilities. Anion gap could be low either because unmeasured anions are low or because unmeasured cations are high. And we actually see all of these examples. So, in the cases of an elevated anion gap, excessive concentrations of negatively charged organic acids, let me give you the famous list, methanol, uremic toxins, diabetic ketoacids, 
paraldehydes, isoniazide, lactate, ethylene glycol, or salicylates. Uh, most famously, the acronym is mud piles. Raise the anion gap and either high unmeasured cations, such as hypercalcemia, myeloma proteins, or low unmeasured anions, such as hypoamnemia, will lower the anion gap. Final concept to understand about an anion gap that will really help you is about the units. Anion gap units are milliequivalents per liter. This is the same units as electrolytes and lactate. Therefore, an anion gap is expected to rise one point while the bicarb falls by one point every time one of these um, excessive organic acids such as lactates rise and vice versa. So for example, if your lactate goes up by seven, you would expect the anion gap to go up by seven and the bicarb to drop by seven. That's really because they're all measured in the same units. So now that we understand the anion gap, we can discuss how do we understand or what is a complex acid-base disorder, at least the way I'd like to define it. I would define a complex disorder as a hidden double or triple acid-base disorder whose presence can only be deduced by inspecting the blood gas and simultaneously accounting for abnormalities in the anion gap or in something we call the delta-delta, which I'll explain in a minute. So we've already described the anion gap. I won't go over that again. Now we'll talk about the delta-delta. In general, a good rule of thumb is for anion gap metabolic acidosis, the fall of the bicarb roughly equals the rise of the anion gap. That has to do with it's the same units. We've already discussed that. So if we are going to try to see if this applies to a given patient, it's ideal to measure the rise of anion gap from the patient's baseline anion gap in the absence of knowing what the patient's anion gap is, we frequently look at the rise of the anion gap from the upper limit of normal of the anion gap. So for example, if a patient's anion gap was 12 and it goes up to 19, we would say it changed by 7. But if we find another patient with an anion gap of 20 and we don't know what the baseline is, we'll just say that it's 6 above normal, even if we don't know what the patient's baseline is. So in an anion gap metabolic acidosis, if the elevation of an anion gap is higher than would be expected for the fall of the bicarb, then there must be a hidden metabolic alkalosis. We've already actually seen one of these problems earlier on in this talk. And in reverse, if the anion gap is not as elevated as the fall of the bicarb, then there must be a hidden non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. I think it's hard to really show these in more detail, these two concepts, without examples. So rather than me trying to explain this to you more, I'm just going to wait for some examples and then I think you'll understand this kind of tricky concept. So we'll do some problems now. Again, I'll try to pause between problems and think about it. And I do think you'll really understand the delta delta and how we apply the anion gap after we review these problems. First problem is this is an acidosis that is not respiratory, so it's metabolic, and we know by Winther's formula, 20 is the correct compensation for a bicarb of 8, because 8 times 1.5 plus 8 is 20. And we also know that the last two-digit rule works pretty nicely here, showing that in the presence of a metabolic acidosis, the last two digits of the pH is close to the pCO2. So, from the first talk, we already knew that this was a compensated metabolic acidosis. But now we look at the anion gap. This patient's anion gap is 18, and the patient has a usual anion gap of 11. So we know their anion gap has gone up by 7, yet the bicarbonate has dropped by 16. Something is making the bicarbonate drop more than the anion gap is going up. And that something is a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis on top of an anion gap acidosis. In other words, the anion gap acidosis does not account for the entire drop of the bicarbonate. So this might be a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis and diarrhea at the same time. So this, in summary, is a double disorder. It's a 
metabolic acidosis without an anion gap plus a metabolic acidosis with an anion gap and that does count as a double disorder. Now pause and come back when you solve this problem. This is a similar example but in reverse. This patient has an acidosis that's a metabolic not respiratory acidosis and it's fully compensated either by Winter's formula or by the last two digits rule. So we know there's a metabolic acidosis. We ha we've learned that the anion gap is 35 so we know for sure there's an anion gap elevated metabolic acidosis. But unlike the other problem where the bicarb fell too much, here the bicarb doesn't fall enough. It has only fallen 8. Now we don't know what this patient's baseline anion gap is, but we know it's going up way above 8. This number 35 is about 20 above the upper limit of normal of anion gap, which is usually around 15. So why does the anion gap go up so high and the bicarb not fall? There must be a second metabolic disorder keeping the bicarb higher than expected. I would have expected this bicarb to be around 5, not 16. Well, the acid-base disorder that makes bicarbs higher than expected is metabolic alkalosis. So in summary, this patient has a double disorder. The patient has a severe anion gap metabolic acidosis and also an occult hidden metabolic alkalosis. So this might be the same diabetic ketoacidosis patient as problem 12, but instead of having diarrhea, they might have had intractable vomiting for several days that precipitated the diabetic ketoacidosis. In fact, before they had the ketoacidosis, their bicarb might have been 36. Last problem is without the more advanced concepts, we would recognize this as a simple single disorder, simply a respiratory alkalosis with a slight acute compensation. If you're not following this, you should, probably should go back to the first talk where I show you how to recognize that. But this, on the face of it, is a single disorder. However, we learn the anion gap is 32. So the anion gap is probably at least 17 above normal. We know there is also an anion gap metabolic acidosis. However, we would have expected the bicarb to drop, and it didn't drop. So there must be a metabolic alkalosis. So this problem here is an example of a classic triple acid-based disorder. It's a respiratory alkalosis that's easy to see, an anion gap metabolic acidosis that can only be seen if you calculate the anion gap, and a hidden metabolic alkalosis that can only be seen if you think about the delta delta concept because the delta delta is extreme here there is a huge change of anion gap but no change of bicarb this is an extreme delta delta so in the scheme of triple acid base disorders this is actually a fairly easy one so here are the answers to problem set 2b and before I go off, I really want to encourage everyone to make sure that they're stopping between problems to uh, answer these on their own. It makes the lesson go better. Also, these lessons go in sequence, so please make sure you really master lessons one and two before tackling the last lesson. And finally, I've posted uh, YouTube videos that my residents have enjoyed for PFT interpretation. And if you just search YouTube, you can enjoy those as well. I hope these are all useful to you. Um, See you um, at lesson three. Take care.